Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's Hulu's original series, Wu-Tang, an American Saga. Season one, episode seven, box in hand. I'll do a recap and review as I go along, and at the end, I'll have notes from a cinematic perspective. That's coming up next. <laughs> It's Bunny. We see a lacrosse team going back and forth, Buckington and the Bulldogs. And we see that Buckington is an all-white school, all-white players, but we see the Bulldogs are black. You know, the coach is black. You can clearly see the division between the two teams. And as they're playing, you see a white player continuously making illegal blows and hitting this one kid in the face over and over again. And we hear the music in the background, which can give us an idea of whose story that we're learning right now. And we can hear Clifford's voice, aka Shotgun, at this time. So we can make an assumption that it's about him and we're learning more about him this episode so during the game he tells the referee hey is this not illegal don't you see that you know what's going on like you saw those hits you see what's going on and the referee blows the whistle and tells him to sit out for one minute on the sideline and he can't play and the team is telling him hey man we got your back it's all right we saw the illegal hit you know try to hang in there later on we see that same character go home and which we think is his home and he goes to the dinner table where two other kids are sitting and the young boy says well you know you should have got here earlier you know you would have been able to eat and we see a bowl a big bowl a serving bowl of dinner that's gone it's already eaten it's some spaghetti that's out of there and he says if you weren't here and you were at home and not freeing off freeloading off of your family maybe you could have got some dinner and it pisses Clifford off and all of a sudden he just goes in and starts beating him up and they're having a fight the a woman walks in and says get off of my son get off of my son and he says you know aunt that's not fair so we know that that's his aunt and the two other children we can assume of course are the cousins and she says you beating on my son get off my son i can't take this anymore you can't stay here and he's saying well where else am i supposed to go you know he's in high school like you know i can't just go to my place and he t she tells him i don't care where you go you lived here now go live with your grandmother maybe she'll let you stay back with her so the cousin is on the ground giving that smirk like mm, my plan worked for you to go off on me and then you potentially get kicked out so that worked we see clifford as the young teenager still in his lacrosse uniform going back to her bruised up saying can i live back with you i just need one more chance so she lets him in and he proceeds to stay there and he puts his stuff down and we see that the couch is where he resides. That is his space. Let us see what happens after that one minute penalty. So Clifford gets up, runs back on the field and just bam, knocks the other guy on his back, the one that had the penalty against him and it was illegally hitting him on his face. And I mean, knocks the breath out of this guy, complete, completely lays him out on his back. And he turns to the referee and says, now that's a one minute penalty. Shotgun is walking. He's upright, he's struggling. He's off of the crutches, but he's on a cane and he's still having trouble walking. And as he's walking, we can see that he's heading back to Bobby's house. And when he sees Bobby's house, he sees a moving truck, a lot of boxes. You can see the defeat and sadness in Clifford's face. Like, wow, Bobby's leaving, he's going home. So we see a flashback of Clifford again. Now he's at his grandmother's house. He's sleep on the couch and she wakes him up and says, hey, you know, look who's back. It's your uncle Anthony. 
And he was like, Uncle Anthony? And you could tell he hadn't seen him in a while. And Anthony is saying, hey, you know, give me a hug. I haven't seen you. And he was just like, well, why are you here? What's going on? And the grandmother says, well, he claims he's clean again. So, you know, we don't know. And Anthony is just like, I'm clean. I'm trying to start anew. This is my new life. You know, just give me a hug. And he embraces Clifford. And it's this uncertainty of where is this going are you okay out of all places why are you here and he says well yeah you know my mom said I could live here again so I'm, I'm have my my stuff on the up and up I'm doing right this time I'm trying to get you know into a, a work program or find a job or maybe do what I was doing before you know and the grandmother has that his mother has that look like you know We'll see what's going on. Clifford walks up to the house and then into the house and he sees that everybody is packing and getting ready to go. And he sees Dennis there that is helping them pack. And even though they've had some static in the past about the song that came out and, you know, Park Hill and all this other stuff, Dennis walks up to him and says, you know, I heard about your boy Hayes. And, you know, I'm sorry about that, man. You know, the, the police, you know, they on that evil stuff. And he gives them some condolence and it's still too early for him to respond and he doesn't give him a response but they share eye, con eye contact and you could tell from the eye contact that shotgun is appreciative that he at least said something Linda is telling Cherie you know hurry up you packing kind of slow when the movers leave whatever's not on that truck stays behind and Cherie is just like well I guess I better just stay in my room so it's really obvious that she doesn't want to move. So she goes back up to her room and Randy is in there. And Randy says, why are you so upset that we're moving? And she says, well, I don't know why I'm upset. I don't know. And Randy, being a child, he says, are you upset because I'm going to? Are you upset because I'm going with you guys? Because I know that you get upset because you have to watch me or be around me a lot. And she realizes, like, wow, you know, I hope this is not what my little brother is thinking. And she says, no, you know, I wouldn't think anything like that. I want to go. I want you to be there with me. They share an endearing hug. And she says, I'm sorry if you ever felt that way. But that's not what it is. So to kind of break the moment of silence, she says, well, why don't you take this box and take it downstairs? He tries to take the box. It's too heavy. And he asks Dennis, well, you know, hey, can you help me? And he shares that look with Cherie. And he says, yeah, I'll help you. So he takes the box downstairs. And in her box, he notices a book that she's reading. And he opens the book and slides in a note just for her and he's really trying to keep it under the wraps and you can tell that he's holding back tears because she's leaving. Vine speaks with Jerome as he's handing them box him boxes on the moving truck and Devon says, man, you're pretty good at organizing those boxes on the truck and you're getting everything in order. And Jerome says, yeah, you know, I learned, you know, certain things because I used to look, work for a moving company when I got out of jail. So I kind of have an idea of how to put it on the truck. And Devon says, yeah, well, you know, I got this interview to clean at the World Trade Center and I got an interview with them. And Jerome says, yeah, man, you know, just make sure you're aware who the supervisor is and who's interviewing you. If it's a white woman, just seem like you're just so happy to work there and you're just so willing to do what it, whatever it takes to do a good job. If it's a white guy, you're never going to get any type of positive feedback or nothing like that. If it's a black guy, just be real with them and be honest, be sincere, and just notice who's interviewing you and who the supervisor is because sadly, that's just the way that it is. And Devon says, yeah, you know, I'll take that under consideration. And after they talk, Bobby walks up to Devon and they're talking and they're looking at Jerome after he's gotten off the moving truck going towards their mom and he's talking with her and he's covering her with a jacket because it's cold outside and Bobby says what you think about this man like what you think is going on with that Devon says well you know mom she seems like she she's happy and you know the brighter side to that Randy he'll get to be around his dad and you know they got a spot so it is what it is. And then we learned that Bobby says, yeah, you know, I'll be staying behind. The fact that we staying behind and Cherie, Mama, and Randy are leaving, man, you know, it's just us. 
So we, we learned that they're moving ahead as a family. The family is kind of getting a little split of growth with Cherie, Linda, Jerome, and Randy going to Ohio and Bobby and Devine not being able to stay in the house because he's still on parole, but he will be in the home by himself pretty much, Bobby. Not that he won't have visitors, but we know as the audience how this family is growing and splitting. Shotgun has a few words with Bobby, like, you know, is this real, man? You know, are you, you, you really leaving? And then he explains to, you know, Shotgun that, no, they're going ahead and I'm staying here. And Clifford has this look of happiness and relief that he tries not to show, like, like, whew, I'm glad Bobby isn't leaving. Because underneath it all, Clifford has been the one that has been very dedicated and coming to Bobby and, and, and getting the music and going to the basement and being so engulfed in the music. So he has this look of relief like, Bobby isn't leaving and out of everything that's happened, I can still work on some music. Divine is having his interview at the World Trade Center and we see that the manager is black and he's being straight up with him. He's just telling him, I got out, trying to be in this program to work I really need this job. I got to take care of my family, whatever I can do. And the black guy says, this is the foundation of what we need, you need to make sure to do. Show up on time. Your uniform must always be on and it must stay clean. And he's giving them full eye contact like, look, this is what it is. And Divine says, I'm always on time. I've never had an issue with that. And... He says, this opportunity is something that I'll be really grateful for. So we don't know the outcome of the interview just yet, but we can tell that the black guy is feeling Divine's honesty, and it's highly likely he'll be there and he'll be working for that company. See Big G come in, you know, genius, and he walks into this fur coat store and he sees all the furs and it looks really nice and lavish and he, he might be coming through a nice back way, but it's a store and he comes in. And as he comes in, he sees a gentleman and two other people looking at coats and they're in the mirror and they're checking themselves out. And the gentleman says, oh, you know, my two o'clock just walked in, just give me a second. And G says, is that Big Daddy Kane? And Roxanne Shantae in your store, he said. Yeah, you know, that's them. And uh, they're here trying on the coats and fur coat business. And the music industry go hand in hand because I got a lot of connections. And he tells them, that last tape that you gave me, a lot of people heard it and they really loved it. What's the name of the guy that you said that was on another tape? What was his name? Oh, that's my cousin. You know, that's my cousin, Bobby Dynamite. As a matter of fact, I got another tape with me that's actually his demo, and you can take, you know, listen to it. So the man, you know, he puts the, the, the tape on, and they're listening to it, and it's the same verse <laughs> that Bobby did at that talent show, or that rap battle that didn't fly too well. And he's listening to the to the verse, and it's the same verse about him being a sperm and him getting through the fallopian tubes. And his cousin G is just like, you know, really trying to sell it, like, yeah, that's fire. <clears throat> and the guy's like, yeah, I like this. And he's, <laughs> G is like, it's a unique sound. <laughs> Divine goes to Dennis's weed spot on Wall Street just to catch up with him to see what he's doing. And he says, hey, man, you seen Bobby? And Dennis is like, I ain't seen Bobby since the family moved. So I don't know where he is. And he needs to get here to the spot and help me out because it's just me. And then when he is here, he's talking to the old man playing chess. And that takes forever because they talking forever. So what's up with that? And Devon is just like, I don't know, man. You know, I'll talk to him. And Dennis is really trying to be discreet in asking about Cherie. He says, so how's the family doing in Ohio? And Devon's like, you know, I talked to them, they're fine. He's like, yeah, Cherie, you know, she'll be done with high school. So how, how's she doing? And when he's trying to inquire about Cherie, Devon says, oh, well, hold up, man, I, I get back with you. And he runs off because he sees the black gentleman that has interviewed him. So maybe he wants to catch up with him and talk to him. So that's the end of that scene. Bobby is looking for a shotgun. And he finds Shotgun at the morning location where Hayes was murdered by a police officer, by the police officer choking him to death. 
and there's candles there and a photo of Hayes. And you could tell that Clifford is in his own zone thinking about him and so deep in thought. And Bobby says, hey man, I got this guy that's really interested in the way I was rapping and he really loved it and he's feeling it. And Shotgun's like, that's good, man. You know, that's really good. And he's like, no, 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 not just me. You know, you, he's really interested. And there's not this automatic reaction of, oh, man, yeah. Shotgun is just like, that's cool. He's not even excited about the thought of somebody trying to sign him because he has so much on his mind. And he can't even think, think straight. And we're seeing flashback thoughts of him in some good times and people that he loved and cared for. We see a scene of Clifford as a teenager, his grandmother and his uncle Anthony preparing to eat dinner. And his grandmother says, well, you know, your mom, she's better now and she's in Staten Island and I really think that you should move back with her. And Clifford is not excited. He's just like, oh, really? And his uncle steps in and says, his team is going to a championship game. They're really, really good and they're going up against these white kids. They always win. He should stay here and he should not only finish out the rest of his school years, but he should go to this championship game. It's the first time that their school has gone to the championship. So he really should stay. And the grandmother says, well, yeah, maybe you're right. And Anthony and, and Clifford, they share a moment between uncle and nephew and he gives them a week like, Thanks, Unc. Thank, thank you, because I didn't want to stay with my mother. You could tell there was an, in, in, an energy of unstable times or unstable parent, parenthood from his mother. So that save that that uncle did, they shared that moment. So we flash back at Clifford at that morning site, still speaking with Bobby, and Bobby looks at the picture of Hayes and says, I know you're going through a difficult time, and I know this is so hard, but Hayes would be happy for you. He knows that that was your passion and what you love to do, and I really think you should consider and come with me because Hayes will want you to do this. He will not want you to miss out on this opportunity. The manager that we saw at the fur coat shop, they are with uh, him, G, genius, Shotgun, and Bobby. They're all at this club, and he's kind of showing him, you know, hey, this is kind of the lifestyle you could have, going to the club, you know, kicking it. And Bobby leans to Shotgun and says, man, we almost there. We almost there. Manager tells Bobby, hey, man, that verse you kicked about the sperm and all that, woo, that was nice. And, you know, Shotgun and G, they looking at each other like, <coughs> all right, because they trying to get a deal. So they're like, okay, yeah, that was hot. But the manager says, and you, Shotgun, what you did, that was really, really nice. You know, you're really authentic. You have such a strong yet raspy voice. That's really, really good. And so they look at each other like, you know, that was great. And G says, you know, yeah, your verse was okay, but yeah. <laughs> Shotgun wakes up at Bobby's house on the couch. So it's evident that they were at the club all night. Shotgun still has the same clothes on he had before. And he's awakened by someone banging on the door saying, you know, hey, man, you hear some, some, some muffled voice. And Shotgun is yelling to Bobby, hey, man, somebody at the door. Like, you know, so Bobby comes to the door and we see that it's Dennis. And when Dennis sees that Shotgun is on the couch, he's upset. He's like, Bobby, let me talk to you for a minute, man. You know, Dennis always upset about something. But anyway, and he tells Bobby, you got this Park Hill dude in here that you working with, that you kicking it with. And you're not working with me? Like, you know, what's going on? And I need you at the weed spot. Where you been? So Bobby fills him in on what's been happening and how a manager is, is pretty much pitching them to a record company and they really got a chance here. They really got a chance to make something great and make some music. And then it says, you're doing all this without me? And Bobby says, the plan is that I can get there and I can get my foot in the door and we, you know, I'm gonna bring you in and you know how I work. If it works for me, it works for you. So give me some time, man, and hang in there and just keep doing what you're doing. And then it says, keep in mind that I'm in the game that I'm in because I was doing stuff for your family. And Bobby says, whoa, for my family, you were doing it for your family too. Don't forget that. 
And it's a reality check for Dennis. Like, you know, dang, you know, he, he's right. Because Dennis, your family needed what it needed. And really, Bobby's family was the hookup in you being able to provide some money for your family. So it was that moment. And Bobby was saying, don't put this on us. Don't put this on me. You made your own choices. Time out. Don't even go there. Bobby and Shotgun, they're taking a nice walk outside and talking. And Bobby is just like, hey, man. The manager said, we really got to start thinking of some names, like for real, for real. We got to start setting some stuff in, in cement and who we are, how we identify our music and all this other stuff. So we got to think of a name. So, you know, what names do you have? And he was just like, yeah, Shotgun was like, I've been thinking about some names. You know, Shotgun is cool, but I was always thinking about, you know, Johnny Blaze or, you know, something like that. What about you, man? And Bobby says, you know, I'm really thinking about, hmm. All right, all right, all right. I heard some five percenters talking, and I heard this name and thought, man, that's really powerful. So I'm thinking about going with Rakim. And Shotgun is just like, well, why Rakim? Like, what's up with that? He was like, I just heard Rakim, and that name just sounded so powerful to me. You know, like, Ra. You know, it's just, it's just really, really strong. And, and, and it's original. And Shotgun is like, that's not original because you heard somebody else say that. And it was from some five percenters. Like, what are, what are you talking about? You overheard some people saying something and you heard a name. That's not original, but okay, whatever. So he says, yeah, I think it's, I think it's something I might go with. See Bobby and Shotgun, they're at this club. And Bobby is on stage and he's giving a performance. And the lyrics <laughs> are geared towards the lady, ladies, if you want to say that. He's talking about going down and the women doing stuff and all this other stuff. And... And the lyrics are, are terrible. And the audience is feeling it. We see that the club is pretty much white. You know, there's some sprinkles of black people, but it's pretty much a white club. And they're eating it up. And they're loving it. And they're like, oh, yeah. And they're feeling what he's spitting. And he performs that. And then Bobby gets off the stage and tells Shaka, hey, man, the energy was great. I loved it. But I ain't never seen so many white people all at one time in my life. And Shotgun was like, you did a good job, man. And he patting him on the back. And he has another flashback scene of when he was a teenager. And it's him and his uncle. They are at a construction site. And we see Clifford. He's mixing this cement in this, in this tin pan to kind of mix cement and mix it around. But he's using a shovel. So his uncle comes up to him and says, hey, man, you know, you don't want to mix it like with a shovel. You got to use a rake because if you use a rake, it's not splashing all over the place and it's not getting on you. And as he's telling him that, the construction site area, there's a lot of white people just looking at these two black employees. And they're just looking looking at him up and down and it's just very uncomfortable feeling at work and Clifford senses that as he's looking around and his uncle is telling him how to mix the cement so one white construction co-worker walks up to Anthony and says hey man what do you think you're doing he was like, I'm just showing my nephew here how to, you know, mix the cement right. And he was like, well, I don't, I don't know why you're here. And he says, what you mean why I'm here? He was like, you're at my site. I was like, what, what are you talking about? So we then see another white supervisor in the, black, uh, in the back that calls him and says, hey, man, you know, come here. And he's just like, hey, man, you know, what's, what's up with that guy? What is he talking about? And he's like, why, why are you, what are you doing? He was like, I was just showing my nephew how to mix the cement. Like, you know, what's the problem? And he says, look, I had a job for you. He said, yeah, you had a job for me. He said, a job for you. And the position that I have right now is for him and he's pointing to Clifford and he's just like so you're gonna give it to a kid something that someone that doesn't even know about construction I've been working for you my whole life and 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 he he has no idea what he's doing and you have to teach him everything and I've been doing construction longer than he's been alive so what are you doing he's just like you did all that and you gave me your time and you used to work for me but you were high you would be high all the time. And when you did work, work for me, when were you not high? So, I mean, hey, it is what it is. And he's fired on the spot. And you could tell his uncle is in this place not only of embarrassment, but the disappointment of this job being snatched 
away from him after doing such a good job, uh, job of getting back clean and trying to develop some type of relationship with his nephew. And they make him leave the premises, leaving Clifford by himself at this construction site. So it's very, very difficult to watch and very sad and you feel so bad for the guy. Having those thoughts in his head during his adolescence and he's remembering all of this sad stuff. We have Hayes' murder. We have the thoughts about him having a rough childhood and the racism and just all of that's going through his head. But he still, through it all, shotgun, wobbles on stage with this cane, goes on stage and still kills it. And the audience is still loving him. Even with the cane and with him leaning and struggling to stay up, he still did an outstanding job on stage, looking so natural as if that's where he needs to be and showing his true gift in lyricism. We see Divine it's nighttime, he's at the World Trade Center, so we know he got, he got the job. He's trying to clean the fl floor, and the machine busts and pops. And he's trying to tell the supervisor, the black guy, hey, man, you know, this machine. And the supervisor is dressed up in a suit and a hat, and he's ready to go out somewhere. And he leaves, like, he don't even say nothing, but he gives Divine that look, like, figure it out, I'm out. <laughs> he don't even say that, but he gives him that look, of, like, <laughs> you know, put the hat on, like, have a good night. And Devon is just like, you can't be serious. And he's just sitting there like, what am I going to do? I guess I got to figure this crap out. And we then see him cleaning the office areas of desks, of a certain desk. And he's looking at, you know, the stuff on the desk. And he just flops down in the chair. And when he flops down in the chair, he is seeing this magnificent window view of the city from the World Trade Center. But when he sits there... It looks so fitting. And he looks like he merges well with that desk and with that power. And we see that when he sits back in the seat to just observe the room. Shotgun kills it on stage. He gets down. He gets comfortable at a table. And it's just, you know, kind of get catching his breath and he just had a nice performance and we also see Bobby he's trying to talk to this girl to the side and she's like oh hey and he's like what's up and she says well you know what's your name and he's like Raheem and she's like are you sure about that because you don't seem too sure about what your name is and as we're seeing that little comical moment we see Shotgun, he's on the couch, and this white guy approaches him in a suit, and he says, man, you know, your performance was really great. And Shotgun's like, thank you, I, I really appreciate that. And he says, you're just so natural on stage, man, and you look really, really great. And that cane, that cane that you're using, you know, that, that's part of your getup, right? What are you supposed to be, like a pimp? And Shotgun was just like, nah, I, I actually needed to get around to walk. And the white guy's like, oh, <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so then we cut to a, a view seeing Bobby talk with the manager guy from the, the fur coat store. And he says, I hated to interrupt you with the girl, but you really got to meet these important people. I want you to meet Monica Lynch. She is from Tommy Boy Records. And we want you to meet these two guys. And the white guy is talking to Bobby, the older gentleman, and says, my son keeps telling me that I got to get back into doing hip hop, supporting hip hop. Uh, but I don't think hip hop's going anywhere. And then we have the son like, dad, it is. You know, it's, it's, it's going somewhere and I believe in it. Yeah. And go back to the table with shotgun and the white guy is saying you know you're a really good looking kid you know that's really marketable and uh that's why you should sign with me you sign with me you don't have to worry about anything just do your music and you need to sign with me because that's better than you know slanging on the streets and getting locked up <laughs> and we see that side neck like what and shotgun says well, no, I've never been to jail. I've never slain, you know, done drugs. I've never sold drugs. I've never done any of that. Because if you think about all the other episodes that we've watched, Clifford was always working. And the only reason why he stopped working at the facility for the Statue of Liberty 
is he got hurt and he got injured and he couldn't go back and forth on the ferry to get there because it was hurting him. It was hurting and making his injury worse. And he's so insulted that the cane that he's using, he slams the table and it splashes drinks all over the all over the place. And we see the manager tell Bobby, like, what's up with him? He's going to mess up everything. Your friend needs to get out of here. So we see some bodyguards come in, and they come into Clifford, and they're like, hey, man, you got to go. And Clifford is just over. He's like, "I'm, you know, yeah, I'm out of here. And he calmly leaves. Bond comes home. You can tell it's morning or another day. He's worked all night. And he sees Bobby, and Bobby's feeding the dog, and he's having a little conversation with the dog. Well, I guess I got to remember to feed you. You know, it's just me that lives here. Divine, he's really tired. He's walking into the house. He's like, hey, man, you know, you got any more of that leftover food or leftover chicken? He was like, man, you should have called me earlier. I was eating it, and I gave the rest to the dog, you know. Divine sits down out of exhaustion with this uniform on, and he tells Bobby, you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but... Remember before mommy left, she said that it's up to us that are, you know, that's here, that we got to continue to take care of each other. I got to do this job that I don't want to do, and you got to do that job that you don't want to do. You got to get out there and you got to sell that weed. You, you know, Dennis is saying that you ain't even out there and you ain't even at the spot and you're not helping them. And when you're there, you're really not helping out that much. Remember that. We got to do jobs that we really don't want to do so we can make it. Bobby says, I understand that. But I also need you to understand, I'm not going just being lazy and because I don't want to go. This manager has approached me. It's a record label that's interested. And what good news to report back to mama that I'm finally doing something with myself. And I'm finally making something happen. And this really might pop off. We really might get a deal. And Divine, the actor, does an amazing job with having a look of sadness, of, hmm, <laughs> then to disappointment, of failure, and then bringing back up a smile, like, let me stop. Let me, let me encourage my brother and be happy for him. And he says, hmm, that's good, Bobby. That's good. And... From the other episodes, we know that Divine is struggling and dealing with being there for his family. And now he's in the situation that he's in and he's seeing somebody that's younger than him who he took care of surpassing him in making something happen. So the push through of that smile, which could be mixing with jealousy and sadness against his own brother was very very it was ex executed by the actor very very well in that scene because you see that he wants to smile for his brother but then he's like he pushes it down and says that's that's good Bobby that's good and Bobby finally smiles like my brother is finally approving and happy for me and they share a smile together and Devon says that's good man that's good Bobby goes to look for shotgun again because he's feeling some type of way and he doesn't like the way that everything is evolving and he wants to reach out to shotgun to see if anybody has reached out to him what the status is which is good because he just don't want to leave him hanging when he finds shotgun shotgun is at the morning site again where hayes was murdered and instead of standing this time now he's on the ground. Shotgun is on the ground, deep in thought in his own world. We see the shift change in this character in depression. Because he went from being bubbly, talking to girls, you know, spitting verses, you know, challenging people to a little quick rap battle in the street or at the basketball court and saying, hey man, what you got? And just cracking jokes to this very shadow dark energy that he's in not only just in mourning but so many traumatic things as a kid with racism him trying so hard and doing so well and being a student being on a sports team but there's racism with that he can't really go home there's no comfort there he's back and forth between 
people in his family that don't want him around and racism again killing his friend Hayes so he's got trauma on trauma on trauma and he's just thinking back at those traumatic moments that has happened in his life because we're seeing the flashbacks back and forth with his character throughout this episode and Bobby says hey man did you get a call from Andre he says yeah I, I got the call and Bobby says hey man look and then he cuts him off and says Bobby get that cream man and they share that slap and that handshake. Bobby is just, he can't say anything because he doesn't know what to do. And he walks off. And when he walks off, Shotgun is sitting there again. And he flashes back at another moment that hurt him so much. He's at the championship game playing lacrosse. And as he's playing, he sees his uncle. Hey, man. It can't be calling a penalty on you. Stop it. And he's high. And he comes on the field. And Clifford is just like, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? And he's trying to pick his uncle up. And the referee is just like, hey, who is that? And he's just like, I, it's my uncle. I'll get him. And he's trying to push him off of the field. But his uncle is clearly stronger and taller. And he's just saying, hey, man, this is just you. Y'all need to stop. And, and y'all white people. And he's just so embarrassing. And this is at the championship game. And there's a police officer that is across the field assessing the situation. Because Clifford can't drag him off of the field because he's too heavy. And he said, please get up. Please get up. And when he finally gets up enough strength to lift up his uncle, he's taking him and walking him off the field. And he sees that the police officer is still coming. And he's just like, I got him. I got him. Because he's trying to protect his uncle from violating his parole and going away again because they've spent time developing that relationship as nephew and uncle. And he's thinking about that and he's thinking about that and he's thinking about it so deeply that he leaves the game. He takes his uncle home and you can hear his teammates like, hey man, where you going? It's a championship game. He doesn't answer, he gets his uncle out of there. When he gets his uncle out of there, we don't know if it's the same day or another day. But we see him walk in the home and his uncle is further back. So we can guess that it was another day or later that day. And we see the grandmother, she's pleading, what's going on? Let him go. What's, what's happening? And the police officer says, you know, he's, he's doing drugs and all this other stuff. And he's just like, no, nah, man, I've been good. I've been good. And we see another police officer come out with a little bag. And he's like, see, he, he's, he has possession. And the uncle is saying, I haven't done it anymore. I, and I especially wouldn't bring it here. Then the officer, they says, and you have a teenager living here, and he's on the house, and he's in the house. I got to get Child Protective Services involved because we can't have a teenager living here, and we got a dope addict in the house. And the grandmother says, no, 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 no. He doesn't live here. He lives in Staten Island with his mother. And Clifford gives that look to his grandmother like, what? But the grandmother had to think of something really quick to say because if not it was highly likely that the police officers would have got child protective, protective services over there and taken him away and the cops say okay kid will you get out of here and you go home so he's having these flashback moments of trauma of things that happened to him in his experience he's always done right he never dealt drugs in a world around him at Park Hill, he, tr he was so straight and narrow to doing the right thing. And it seems like he can never have his moment of, wow, I'm doing the right thing and look what's happening to me. And I lost my opportunity to rap because somebody was insulting me and I slammed some drinks down. He looks like he's just the lowest of the low of the low. Andre and Bobby, they go to the record store to pull together some ideas and just kind of brainstorm about what's next. And Andre says, okay, so you got a deal. So now the next step is you got to have your single because the single is what's going to make it known and, and, and who you are and all of that. So start thinking of some songs and maybe some beats that you like. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to muster up something. And he's like, muster up something? What you mean? He was just like, yeah, with the song. He says, no, 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 don't think about that. I just need you to rap. 
just rap. That's your focus right now. So Bobby is just like, okay. <laughs> because if you're smart, you know that at that moment, that wasn't his strongest suit. His power and his talent was producing and putting together samples and putting sounds together and, and, and different cuts and hooks that nobody had ever did. Everything was different. It was fresh. So Bobby says, well, since I'm not doing it, let me at least just kind of look at here and look at some records and see. And Andre says, oh yeah, you know, here, get James Brown. Bobby's like, that's cool, but it's been done. Like, you know, a lot of hip hop records have James Brown in it. So he was just like, nah. He's like, oh, what about this one? What about I'm on the rock right now? What about this record? Bobby's just like, are you serious? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so Bobby's like, well, you know, I can do my own producing. You know, I can do my own stuff. And Andre's just like, no, 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 no. Rappers don't produce their stuff. We get other producers to do that. And Bobby's looking at him like, well, why? You know, <laughs> he's just so confused. So he's looking through the catalog, catalog of records. And Bobby said, this this right here. Yeah, that's it. And it's Denise Williams. You know Denise. And I just got to be me. Da, 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 da. I mean, it's a classic. So Bobby like, you know, how do producers do this? I can I can rap on that. Let's let's go. Okay, okay. <laughs> Bobby is in the studio. We hear the sample, we hear the beat. Doom, 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 doom. Bobby's in the in the studio. He got his headset. He ready. And we hear the track. Oh, we love you, Rakeem. Yeah, we love you, Rakeem. And it's terrible. <laughs> it is a terrible produced track. But Bobby's flowing to it. And he's flowing and it's a, it's a verse basically saying he's the ladies man and he can do what you want and he's flowing with the song and it is complete trash. It's complete garbage. I was gonna say garbage, but yeah, trash, hot mess. <laughs> See Cherie, Linda, Randy, and Jerome, they're all at the house in Ohio, which I was happy to see um, that they were happy and they were having a good time there. And she's reading a book on the stairs outside of the house. And as she's reading the book, she finally finds the letter that Dennis put in, that, that he put in the book before they moved. And she's happy, like, oh, wow, I have something of Dennis here with me. And she reads it, and we see bits of bits and pieces of the letter, which is probably the real letter because it looks like his writing, if you know who the rapper is. So maybe she still had that to this day. If she still had it, that would be the bomb, if she still kept that letter. But anyway, we still, we saw shots of the letter and different words and verbiage in the letter. So she was very happy to see that he wrote her a little something, something. See on the screen one month later. So it's been a month since everything has happened, since the move, since Bobby getting a deal, everything. And Shotgun walks into the record store and he's still having thoughts about when he was a kid and he's still thinking about Hayes. And he, he, he thinks about when he was walking home from a lacrosse game. And he's getting picked on by people on the block. Like, look at this hockey brother right here, you know, with his hockey stick and, you know, just walking around. And we see uh, uh, another boy that's in that group that says, hey, man, you ain't heard about that. That ain't no hockey. That's lacrosse. And that's your boy. You know, he play. And if you mess with him, he gonna F you up, man. Leave that, leave that brother alone. You don't want to talk about him. And other boys are just like, for real? All right, then. We leave him alone. And... Uh, Clifford and Hayes, they share eye contact and, and Clifford gives them that nod like, thank you, bro. Like, thank you. Nice looking out. <laughs> so he, he's still thinking about Hayes and he's still thinking about memories as he's in the record store. When he's in the record store, he's flipping through and we see shot across the store and they connect with eye contact and they look at each other like, Nah. <laughs> Cause they got a little beef when it comes to lyrics, when it comes to seeing each other on the block. So they got that competitive spirit. It's always been a competition between them two. So Shy is looking through the records and he sees a, a, an album and he picks it up. He's like, hey shotgun, come here, man. I'm like, what the hell? And he looks at this record and he's just like, is this Bobby? And he's looking at it like, this your boy right here? This is record? And then Shotgun like, nah, that can't be him. But they reading it, and it says the name, and it is a terrible, 
caricature of what Bobby looks like and women all around him. So it looks like this cartoon with exaggerated features, true minstrel show art that looks absolutely terrible and all the ladies around him that are kissing him and they're making him out to be this ladies man. And Shotgun and, and, and Shy, they look at each other like, they didn't got my boy, what the hell? So that is the end of the episode. Now to cinematography notes and writing that you might have missed out on. Another well-written episode because you gotta think you have several different lives and situations and experiences going on at one time that you blend together into one story. So I like the fact that we were able to look into Clifford's life, AKA Shotgun at the time, into who he was, the hardships uh, uh, of him. And the writing allows us to see that everybody in the ghetto ain't like this. Everybody in the ghetto don't do that. Clifford always wanted to do the right thing in this, this, this terrible environment of, of the, the epidemic uh, of crack and and violence and all of this stuff and the battle with uh, Singleton and Park Hill and all this stuff but he always wanted to be involved with sports he always tried his best with school and he had such family trauma such school trauma with racism speaking with someone that's always done uh, gone to PWIs predominantly white institutions or schools I can attest to that there's always the racist remarks. There's always uh, the undertone, slick comments that uh, you don't catch when you want to record somebody and catch that moment of racism. And they do it and there's no way to catch it. But you feel like, wow, I have these smarts. I have these things. Why should I feel guilty about all the hard work that I've been doing? And why should I stop being great because we have all this racism around, uh, around us? So. We see that Clifford was a good guy. We see that he was a good kid and he was trying to make the best out of every situation. He never had a good housing environment. He never had foundation when it came to family. Now, even though with Bobby's family and him slanging and doing all of that, they were in a nice home. They were in the good side of town. They were in between the Park Hill and Singleton beef that was going on, and they were right in the, in the middle. Not saying that that's any better, you know, but I'm just saying that the dynamic of family, you know, having a foundation is family, uh, the way you're seeing your family all the time, uh, um, was something that he didn't have. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Um, but what they all have in common is racism. They all have in common them trying to do something with them with their lives, with the systematic racism, the systematic school system, the systematic injustice system, everything. They all shared that. They all had that in common because they were in dealing with the same stuff, being black men in America. Um, the moments with Cherie and her brother and moving, her coming into her adulthood and... Uh, having her mother there but are they really connected now young woman to woman having those conversations um i loved the writing of this and what i took from this episode was all of the trauma that the gentlemen all of the gentlemen which we know to be wu-tang today had all of those traumas and all of those experience. so it's experiences. So it's great to see that each episode, they are taking their time as much as they can with the time that they have in the series of 10 episodes with this season, expressing to you what they went through to bring you in emotionally with the character. If it's one thing I can't stand with a movies, a series, anything, it are things that are rushed. If you are not going to take the time to pull me through, don't do it. Good example with Straight Outta Compton. Immense, immaculate writing of pulling all the information into two hours. That's, that, that's the bomb. You didn't feel once that it was rushed. Uh, because they gave you so much detail and you had very well seasoned crisp actors in it that that were able to to lock it down and you didn't feel confused or anything I, I'm starting to feel that even more with this series 
when I explained in the, in the introduction video for the series that I encourage you to watch, if you have not watched it, was the style of writing for this series. It's not the grit and the grimy look and feel of Straight Outta Compton, so it's not something to compare because of totally different budgets, totally different producers, totally different directing. But what I do like is they're, they're, they're trying to take their time as much as possible with what's allotted it to them contract-wise through this Hulu series. What was really important, the number one thing, was the record industry. <laughs> That's a totally different video right there. But giving us a salt grain of what people experienced with these racist, um, I, you got a talent, let me take advantage of you, record labels. You have, and, and, and what blows me away is if I think about how many other careers were effed up because of terrible marketing, racism, uh, 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 making them throw away their talents and telling them, oh, no, 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 do this. That was just a salt grain of the beginnings of that. Taking advantage of Bobby, you liked his gift in him producing, but you wanted to make a quick, quick profit and pick the one without the strongest lyrics, which I hate to say at that time, I don't want to insult anybody, but when you listen to a shotgun and you listen to a genius at the time and you pick Bobby because you knew he was a producer. So you took that producer, you split up the potential of making something great, you watered it down, you dumbed it up, you slapped the label on it and you put it out there. Terrible. I hate to think how much talent was thrown in the trash and done dirty. Just from TV One, the, ser the series that they have called Unsung, I love those because I love to hear about what happened to artists and their experiences and actors. But what we learn with every Unsung episode on that network, the TV One, uh, uh, is that it all boils down to the dirty industry. The shady industry with acting, the shady industry with entertainment. And that's what we see. And that's why Sha and Shotgun are in the record store like, all oh, this hot music that Bobby don't put out on the street and this is what they came up with. Wonderful writing. I loved the episode. I'm loving this journey. So throughout these, all of these reviews I've said, uh, it's probably just one series. Maybe they're just showing us to uh, introduce us to all the people, leading us up to the crescendo of development of who Wu Tang is. So, in other words, if they ended at episode 10, and episode 10 was just showing us all of the steps into who they are as Wu Tang, it would still end well because we know the final result. You know, we, we know that was all right, you know, when it came to putting out some hot music, that would be fine. If there is a season two, that is when we start, we hit that top of, of the roller coaster. If there's a season two, that's when we take that big dip and go, woo! <laughs> <laughs> and we get to hear some of that Wu-Tang music and that fire and that power, learning their name, Wu-Tang names, how they put verses together, how Bobby, I keep saying the government names because I don't want to ruin it for anybody that doesn't know the Wu-Tang clan or doesn't know their music, how they all put it together as a team and picking their new names for Wu-Tang. So if they do a season two, great, because that will be us seeing and hearing the music and them finally getting in there and just getting on the mic and just, just effing it up, right? But if they end in season one, as a viewer, I don't want you to be disappointed because if it ends in season one, that, that could be good as well because we at least have learned the process and them becoming who they are, which is a backstory. It would be a backstory series. So I want to set your heart up for that. <laughs> just in case they don't go to season two. If they go to season two, then we're actually getting into Wu-Tang unless they leave that breadcrumb at the end of season nine. Because this is episode seven and you don't wanna rush a whole bunch of stuff 
for eight, nine, and ten. That would be stupid to have this series going as well as as it's going and then do dumb crap like that. That would be really, really dumb. And I would go in on the writers and directors. But I have a feeling they're gonna do that. I have a feeling they're gonna end it either of those two ways that I described. So let me know what you think. Subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any posts. And follow me on Instagram, same profile name, official bun underscore E. And I also want to encourage you guys to check out other intro videos that I have posted on my page that would encourage you to diversify what you watch on television and learn about different shows. Diversify your palette, man. You know, check out other things on the page and look at the playlist so you don't have to dig through a lot of stuff. I love y'all. Bye.